Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Adrian Gledhill is the returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out Adrian's first and relatively brief appearance on episode 654 of Boundless Body Radio, titled Reviewing the Hack Your Health 2024 Conference with Tony James Madry, featuring Adrian, Tony Pascola, who you can find at Primal Foundations, and James Lehman, who you can find at The Carnivorist. That episode was one of my favorite episodes I've ever recorded with some of my dearest friends that I've gotten to spend some quality time with. Adrian's insane story includes a life of battling weight gain and obesity, being a contestant on the insanely popular and very controversial Biggest Loser television show. She's also had health difficulties through giving birth to five babies, having weight loss surgery, suffering with multiple chronic conditions, and finally finding some healing with the carnivore diet. I was super grateful to meet my new friend at the recent Hack Your Health conference in Austin, Texas. You can find Adrian on Instagram at Adrian K. Gledhill and on YouTube by that same name, Adrian K. Gledhill. Adrian Gledhill, what an honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. The honor is mine. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's very mutual. It was so great to meet you in person. And we got to spend a lot of time together at the conference. We had a dinner together where we were in a big group of people at Lisa Wiedemann's meetup. Had such a lovely chat. And it was just I love those conferences. Not only do I go and like learn some things like we talked about on that last episode, but the, I think the main takeaway that all of us got out of that was to be in community with people that have similar values and just to, just to be in that presence was just so wonderful. I had such a great time. A hundred percent. I was in it for the people. Uh, that's great. What were some of your favorite moments? I know I asked you this on that other episode, but what were some of your favorite moments from this conference in particular? The feeling you get in your heart when you meet people that you've seen, like when I saw you, I've been following Boundless Body for a while, uh, seeing James again, I got, I saw him last year, and just to get to see him again, um, to just talk to people who are doing the same kind of things that you are working towards optimal health, trying to help other people, it just, this, and then also people who eat meat, they're just happy people, so it's just nice to be around positive, happy people who are all working towards the same thing that you are. Um, so I really truly was in it for the people and just everywhere you went, you took like a dopamine hit. It was just so nice. So yeah. that's, that was my favorite. It was definitely just meeting people. Ooh, I got to meet Dr. Boz and uh, Maria Emmerich, two people who I really admire. And that was just amazing too, to get to talk to them and, and you, and you get to just really see how human they are and they're so kind and they're excited to see you too. And uh, so, yeah, that's just, I just love conferences because of that. <laughs> I love that. And I, I kind of forget, um, you know, what it's like when we put these people on pedestals, we follow these people. Like I, I got to meet Craig and Maria Emmerich, which is great, but seeing their kids, I was like for a second, like a little starstruck, like, Oh, you're famous. I see you all the time. You do this really delicious food and taking that bite with your big, big eyes lighting up. Like you're kind of famous to me. <laughs> yes. And they were so humble and happy to see you too. And they weren't all diva ish or anything. They were just like, Yes, I'll take pictures with you. You know, they were just, they were wonderful. The whole family. Uh, I love them. And yeah, it was a really great experience. It was so cool to meet the people that we look up to in this space. And also to meet all of the people that have found this way of eating because they've struggled or suffered with so much in their life that has kind of forced their hand a little bit into this area. And that's why I'm so looking forward to chatting with you today and getting to know you and your story a little bit more that quite frankly, I don't, besides the times that we've talked a little bit about it, we haven't gone in great depth into it. And I, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we'll get to how you got onto the show here in a minute, but what was it like to actually be involved with the biggest loser. Like, I think everybody understands what that was and everybody was watching at a certain time. Like, what was it like to be in that contest? Honestly, I, some people have such negative things to say, but for me, it was a dream come true. I, I mean, to get to, I was a small town girl. I wasn't doing a ton of traveling at that time or anything. So to be flown to LA and in front of producers and cameras. And back then we didn't have smartphones at all this was like 2006 so we had I think that was flip phone time like I had to VHS record and mail the video in so you know these <laughs> days people can kind of create content but back then it wasn't like that so to be filmed I and to be and then I made it into the there was an episode that was a um a makeover and to get someone doing your makeup and and have those people doing your hair and just to feel so glamorous and 
my season was on something called the Hummingbird Nest Ranch, which is just this gorgeous mansion. So we got to live in a mansion. And then um, I was a big fan my whole life of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And our host was Caroline Ray. And so I got to meet her. And um, I actually didn't really watch the show prior to being on it. So it didn't mean a lot to me to meet the trainer. Wow. Well, <laughs> you're kidding. Well, That's funny you didn't watch. I was on season three, so it was actually a pretty new show, but it had blown up so quickly. It, you know, it was it was a hit when I was on it for sure. Um, wow. I, I don't remember how many thousands and thousands of people applied. I mean, just the Mall of America. I went to an open casting call. I bet there was a few thousand people in line at the Mall of America. And that was one of, you know, 50 open casting calls that they did. So, I mean tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people applied. So it was just crazy. And then, you know, being a small town girl, being overweight my whole life, I just kind of had this. And then for most of my life, we were very impoverished. Like we didn't have a lot of money. And so in my mind, the sky wasn't the limit. I mean, they, they teach you that in school, but in my heart, the sky wasn't the limit. And to be picked for that and go to L.A. and be part of a TV show that was on national TV that, you know, everybody tuned into. Because back then there was cable, but there wasn't like the streaming that there is now. Everybody watched TV back then. I don't even know. Did they have a remember when you could record network TV? Yeah, like like TiVo or something. I'm thinking. Yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, so everybody would record their shows. You couldn't have them on demand all the time. Uh, the recording was a newer thing. So to just be part of that was just, I mean, I myself was like, my eyes were like, whoa, you know. Wow. I saw a recent video of somebody who's like a 40 year old guy, like trying to explain to a young girl, like what, what it used to be like to watch TV shows. And she was like, well, why don't you just watch until the TV show's over? Then you could stream the whole thing. He's like, there's no, I'm telling you, there's not streaming. Like a TV show would end in June and you'd be left on like a four month cliffhanger until the first episode of the next one. You'd have to wait that out like a savage. And this, this millennial girl just it could not compute in her head. Like you couldn't well, we'll just record it. Like, no, there was no recording even back then. <laughs> Funny to think back on our, our struggles. Yes. And honestly, unless you recorded it, it was kind of difficult to get a copy of the previous season because there totally. wasn't the streaming. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so funny you yeah, would have so to like funny. buy it on dvd i think i had to buy the previous seasons on dvd to watch them I mean, wow <laughs> that's the time we we're really, talking we really suffered we really made it through those tumultuous times <laughs> but because of that the viewership was way higher than it is these days these days everybody spread out i think the Good viewership point. back then was millions and millions and millions and th these days i don't think millions of people even hardly watch the news anymore i mean yeah that's you know. a really good point that's a really good point um so yeah so you told us a little bit about you know what it was like to be there obviously you can't be on the biggest loser unless you're very unhealthy and quite big so let's go back to you growing up i believe your is your home state uh the same as mine north dakota where i was born i'm actually from minnesota but i went to college minnesota. in north dakota where okay. in north dakota were you from I was born in Bismarck, but I only lived there for like a year, year and a half. So I can't really call it my home state, but it's the state I was born in. Yeah, I went to college in Grand Forks and we drove through Bismarck one time. <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, so I grew up in Minnesota and um, my parents were very young. They were 21 when they had me and my mom was not ready to be a mom. So my dad ended up raising me and my little sister all by himself. And he moved in with his mom. He was kind of a more of a laborer. Then, because he, he was so young when he had us, he didn't have a degree. He never finished his degree or anything. So he had to work 24 hours a day to kind of afford all of us plus grandma. And so we were eating, you know, all of the noodles, the pasta, you know, the, the, the potatoes, you know, all the processed food, the mac and cheese. I mean, goulash was like our healthy food, which was macaroni and cheese with tomato sauce and hamburger. And I remember just like endlessly eating this stuff. There was bread at every single meal. I don't know if they told us that was healthy back then or why was there bread at every meal, but there was bread at every meal. And then you would wash it down with some orange juice. That's That was a pretty common drink at our table was orange juice and milk. Um, so that's what I grew up on. And then because my dad was working all the time, I was with sitters a lot, like all the time. And so I was really uncomfortable just not ever being home 
And I remember just using food as comfort. You know, my mom's gone, my dad's working all the time. So food was comfort. And I just never felt full. I mean, I remember this just just constantly. And so I remember I wasn't even in school yet. And I was already on my first diet. It wasn't me that put me on the diet. It was everybody else around me because they were like, this girl is huge. We need to, we need to put her on a diet. We need to restrict what she's eating which in retrospect really is, I mean, for all the parents out there, that's a really hard mindset for children that they're supposed to be taught that they shouldn't be, that they should be hungry, that they're big because they, you shouldn't really. So for me today with, I have some kids that struggle with weight. So I just say, let's focus on protein. Let's focus on movement instead of let's focus on a diet. So then I go into elementary school and I'm picked on quite a bit. I mean, every day the boys would follow me around and just bully me. I'd like to say for anybody out there who has a bully kid, those kids turned out to be great kids. Like they're not bad people, but kids are kids. And I was very much bullied. So then again, going back to that comfort of that, those noodles, the bread, you know, the orange juice. Um, and I don't know if you want me to keep going, but I go into high school and that's when I kind of get a little bit of confidence. My dad remarries. I have a stepmom, so I have a mother figure in my life. We have a little bit more money. Um, so I'm able to play sports now and I'm in soccer and cross country skiing and golf and track and field basketball. And I just stay busy all the time and I'm able to slim down a little bit like the one sixties. Um, but the minute I went to college, I just blew up. So that's when I applied for the TV show, The Biggest Loser. Okay, gotcha. So when you were at college, that would have been what? You're like in the 20s when you finally applied for the show? So I was 22 when I was on the TV show. Okay. And I went to an open casting call and I also mailed a VHS in. And then I got an email from like Susie Johnson at gmail.com. And I was thinking, is this real? And it was. Uh, and so we flew there and I, even when I was flying there, I was thinking, is this really real? It's too good to be true. And they sent me a contract that was like four inches thick. It was hundreds of pages and you had to sign every page. And I was so nervous that my stepmom had to drive across Minnesota to come be with me and read every page to me. And as I signed it, cause I was so nervous. Uh, but yeah. Wow. Um, and so your time in college, uh, would it, was it, as you're looking back, was it the same kind of foods that you were eating in elementary school that made you gain the weight back? Um, or were you, I mean, were you getting more hungry than you were before? Like, as you're looking back, what, what drove the weight gain in? I think I was definitely having metabolic issues already. Cause I put the weight on pretty quick. I don't think it was that I was just eating endless ice cream and pizza. It was, I was, my metabolism has always been a little lower, which I now attribute maybe to living in a moldy home growing up and mm. as well as other things, you know, all this processed food we ate has messed with people's hormones. And so, um, so I don't think it was necessarily just binge eating. I think it was me stopping exercising and maybe eating a little more than usual, drinking alcohol and alcohol is just horrible for your waistline. And then just not knowing, just, just truly not knowing the right things to eat. I mean, I'm pretty sure I was still eating salads every single day, but yet I was gaining weight. And so I just yeah. didn't know about low carb and I wasn't moving very much. Um, so, so when you entered the contest, do you, do you recall what your weight was? I think it was around 227. 227. Okay. Um, I thought most people on The Biggest Loser were closer to like three, four or 500 pounds. Maybe I'm just remembering as the show went on and things got a little bit more extreme that people got up to that height. Were you, um, was that pretty average for the cohort of people in your show about that weight? So mine, there was one person from every state. So with 50 people, they did their best to have a whole variety of weights and ages. So I was definitely one of the smallest and I think I was the youngest person. Youngest. So when, and what they did was they had 36 people go home the first day and whoever lost the most weight at home was going to get to come back on. They never thought in a million years, this young girl that didn't have as much to lose was going to beat these 350 pound men, but I did. And it, at the time I thought, oh my gosh, I'm amazing. Look at me. I beat everybody. I'm so awesome. Well, now that I'm 40 
now I know I had a, a metabolic advantage over, but you gotcha. know, the rest of the contestants. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So your expectations, was this going to be something life-changing, not just that, you know, it was kind of glamorous and you were going to be on TV, but this was, this was your way out of this situation. You were in a place where you didn't want to be as far as weight and health. And this was the thing that was going to get you out of that. Would you say that was your expectation? Well, it's really weird is I think most people who are overweight, I don't think that they ever necessarily dream of being glamorous because we kind of are in hiding. Like we don't like our bodies. You know, we don't want attention on us. Um, I, it gets sickening to be constantly the biggest person in the room. So you just kind of hide back a little bit. So I don't think my intention was ever to be glamorous. It was just to finally not be big. I thought that if I lost all this weight, that I would finally, that people would finally treat me like an equal. And in my head, people weren't treating me like an equal. I would finally get that good job, the big thing. I would finally be lovable because in my mind, between the bullying and my parents being gone and working and basic, my mom basically abandons me. So I had abandonment issues. Um, I thought if I lose this weight, I'll finally be lovable. I think that was the number one thing. So I lose 66 pounds and I find myself back at my high school weight and I realize that it's going to be a, it's going to need a bit more than that. It, there's going to have to be some work between here. It's very interesting. And it's, it's just so, I don't know. It's, it's so sad to hear that that's what the reality of the situation is and how much worth we put into how we look. And um, yeah, that's, that's a really tough situation. So tell us how long were you there at the actual mansion? I, I believe you told me you were one of the ones that had to go home essentially, and do the weight loss at home. How long were you at the mansion itself? I don't remember, but I want to say it was a couple of months. Uh, by the time I got kicked off, there was only one contestant after me that got kicked off, and then it was the finale. So oh, okay. gotcha. that's, that's a very interesting thing. And so the people who were at home had a totally different experience than the people who were on the ranch. Um, on the ranch, the film is so long and it changed season to season. I'm interviewing different people on my station um, who were on the show and it very, it really varies. In the beginning of filming one week could take two, three weeks to film a week. So if a season is 12 weeks long, people could have been there easily twice as long as that just to wow. film the show. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Um, and I've, I've talked to people who have been there, talking to you and knowing that you've talked to so many people there. What was it like? Like, what was your day to day there? So it's very interesting because you picture as you watch the show that maybe a nutritionist is there to tell you what you're going to eat for the day. Maybe there's someone to help you cook. Who knows? Maybe there's a maid. Um, and then, of course, the trainers are there every day to cheer you on, tell you what to do or beat you up, whatever. Um, um, and that every day is just really structured, but that's not how it is at all. The filming is crazy. You could film at five o'clock in the morning, or you could film at 1 a.m. because they, because we were in the desert and they wanted to catch the dark lighting in the cooler temperatures because you can't have the fans and the air conditioning on because it messed with the mics. Today there's better mics, but back then you had to turn it all off because it messed with the mics. Um, so the filming schedule is crazy. You never know in advance when the filming is going to be. So you can't really like plan your week out. Um, the trainers were only there when the cameras were there mostly. Um, and later on seasons, I guess there were shadow trainers that would come a couple times a week so that there was more hands on. But mostly people were alone. That's what it mostly was. And the day to day, you're there alone, you're mic'd up, you're working out. Um, it was eat as little as possible, move as much as possible. There wasn't a lot of hand holding, And so if you're in a weight loss, you feel all this pressure and it's not even about the money. It's about the pressure of the whole situation of wanting to succeed. Very disordered behavior occurs. It's yeah. so, and, and, and even if you look at the, when the trainers were there, they're taking these 400 pound people, 300 pound people and telling them burn into, and don't stop even if you have to puke. That is not a recipe for anything except for injury, burnt out hormones. You know, that's not a recipe for health. And anybody who, once you join the health space, realizes that it's like, what would you say? 90% diet and 10% exercise or even less than that. But they 
just make it look like it's all about the exercise and less about the nutrition. So That's people the were just, part. yeah, yeah. So people were just, I mean, I know Jillian has come out and said her contestants that were girls, she would try to have them um, eat about 900 calories, low fat, uh, low, very low fat, low carb per day, and then burn 5,000 calories a day. I mean, that is such a recipe for metabolism killing. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I was, sorry, I was using metabolic carts for the better part of my career where I was actually measuring people's metabolic rates. And the one woman that I measured who did the contest, uh, she must've done it um, probably around 2010, 2011. Um, and she had just been kicked off as well. And we, she had done the test uh, to test her resting metabolic rate before. And I remember it was fairly normal. By the time we did the test, her resting metabolic rate should have been about 2000 calories and it had already reduced by half. So it was already around 1000 calories. And, and she described a lot of the same thing. Um, I remember she told me that they were working out about six hours a day. I remember that they were on 1200 calorie a day diets. Um, it sounded like at least at that point, that sounded a little bit more structured from what I recall versus when you did it earlier on, I'm curious, like, what did, what did you do for food? Like, do they have like endless amounts of food options that you can have? Do you have to cook or shop yourself or like, how did, how did you sort that out? We weren't allowed to leave. So we would tell the production assistants what we wanted. So that was actually kind of nice because you could probably order anything you want. I mean, even it. I mean, they said you couldn't order cookies, but that would make good TV. So I kind of feel like they would have, if you would have asked for cookies, I feel like they would have brought them. <laughs> um, so it was, the food part was nice. I mean, to, you could eat like a king. You definitely could. You could eat like a king because they would just bring it. You were in charge of cooking it and you were in charge of cleaning. So our kitchen was a mess because nobody ever picked up after themselves. And I've heard that same thing through every single season that the, the kitchen became a toxic wasteland because nobody ever picked up after themselves but so the food was pretty good but again there wasn't really a lot of direction in my season what to eat except wow. when I was an at-home contestant we got a nutritionist a psychologist and a doctor we got a very specific plan we had weekly support calls and you could email or call anytime you wanted if you needed any support plus there was 36 of us so we had community when you get on the ranch, they didn't have hardly any direction. They were just kind of making it up. And the people wow. that they had directing them weren't a doctor, a nutritionist, or a psychologist. I mean, Jillian has come out and admitted that prior to the show, she had helped a couple celebrities lose five, 10 pounds. She wasn't, you know, this, 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 you know, obesity weight loss specialist by any means. And she admitted in multiple interviews recently that it was an experiment. Every season was an experiment where she played around with different things. Um, so you will hear different experiences. I know one thing people talk about is that they've heard about this lawsuit where people were given weight loss drugs. Not a single person I've ever talked to that was true. So if that happened to 1% of people, okay. But the 99% that I talked to, that's not our experience. It was eat very, very little and then work out all the time. Wow. That's so interesting. That's way less organized than I would have assumed. Um, you mentioned the trainers would only be there kind of when the cameras are on and then they would kind of split. Did you have any type of like relationship with the trainers as far as like, they're my buddy, I can talk to them um, or anything like that? Or was it really just like, they, they showed up, did the thing for TV and took off. So I came in, you know, halfway through the season. So they had already built relationships with their contestants and I had beat their contestants. So they hated me. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were like, this is making us look terrible. They were ticked off because they were like, we're supposed to be the professionals and you did this at home without wow. us. That's wow. not cool. And you beat us. And then the contestants themselves hated our guts because we got to be home with our family. Well, they had to be there. We weren't injured. They were all of them. You know, we had hand holding and tools and resources. They had almost nothing. You know, there's no nutritionist there. There's no psychologist. You know, they just kind of had to talk to themselves in a corner if they needed any psychological work done. Um, some of them did build relationships with their trainers. And to this day, when you look in our alumni group, because we have an alumni group on a private one on Facebook, um, they will say that they feel like they did have a relationship. But most people have commented that they felt that it was very artificial. Interesting. 
Wow. I, it's so fascinating. Like all the, the tools that you were given and assuming that, you know, the nutritionist or the doctor or whatever that you had was like probably misguided in the information that they were giving you, but at least they were giving you something. And you mentioned something really curious, like the, the community aspect. So, so critical, regardless, again, of the information you're getting, that must have been incredibly helpful to feel like you had support. You weren't the only one kind of going through this. You weren't like isolated. You could actually like communicate with people that are going through kind of the same thing. That must have been huge. A hundred percent. A couple of us got a matching tattoo of a 36 with a turtle. It's a long story, but, um, and I just went on a cruise with one of them. So like, uh, we're, we're pretty tight. Um, now, one thing you had said was the advice wasn't super great. I do want to say Dr. Heizanga, who was the show's doctor, I think for the entirety of the show, he did say, I mean, I was on season three and he said, I'm not going to, he said, I'm not going to be very supportive of um, vegetarianism. He said, I really need you guys to eat some meat. And he, it was either him or the nutritionist. Now that I think about it, one of the two, but I'm pretty sure it was Dr. Heizanga said that he had clients as a doctor in LA who were vegetarian and had heart attacks in their forties and that the, the vegetable fats were what was clogging people's arteries. So he said, we, it was really important. He had said to get some animal fat in there. So wow. I thought that was interesting that even in 2006, he knew that That's there impressive. was a place for animal protein and fat. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's the very people impressive. On the show, they were eating sugar-free jello and sugar-free dressings and whatever was the commercial for the season, you know? Oh, funny. I didn't even think about that. Of course, they would be stocking up whatever food company products. Um, I, I, I hadn't even thought about the product placement and something like that. Oh, incredible. I mean, I want to say one season was Cheerios. <laughs> Part of this complete breakfast. <laughs> yes. Um, wow. I know one of our main sponsors was Jenny O Turkey. So we had Jenny O Turkey coming out the rear. Wow. Yeah. I'm sure you in never want to see that again. <laughs> in retro, you know, at the time I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Cause it's low fat meat. This is yeah, great. Totally. Thank you for yeah. all the free meat. This is so wonderful. And now I'm like, that's kind of gross. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you'll never eat that ever again. Um, are there any other like interesting stories or experiences that you had while you were involved with that show? I thought it was interesting that behind the scenes, there were some romantic things happening. Okay, nice. <laughs> getting, we're getting the fresh pulp 18 years later. Behind the scenes, people, you know, they're starting to feel better about themselves. Their hormones are flowing because when you're extinguishing that fat, you're releasing a lot of extra hormones. And uh, there was some hooking up. That's great. <laughs> you heard it here first. Again, 18 years ago, we got the fresh, the fresh pulp here on Film Spotty Radio. That's great. Uh, there have been some marriages out of the show. So it's I guess oh, it's cool. not that shocking. Nice. Oh, that's great. I I guess I never assumed that, but that makes a lot of sense. So <laughs> after the contest, it it did just, you mentioned 66 pounds. Was that your weight loss? You did lose 66 pounds? I did, but the minute I went home. It, what was that? I, like? So I had an immense, from the minute I was voted off, I remember they did put a psychologist in the truck after the vote off. So we were in like a black SUV Escalade type thing. And I get in the Escalade and there's a psychologist and I'm like, oh, this is the last thing I want to do right now, you know? Uh, but he was there to make sure that you were okay. But that was about the extent of the post-show, you know, psychological. Like, and I think people could have really used some more support after the show for sure. Especially most people had come from a place of feeling shame, hiding, you know, body dysmorphia, body issues, image issues. And then to be kind of thrown in the limelight without a lot of support is a little weird, but so the minute, but I just remember just feeling like I lost, it wasn't about $250,000. It was about wanting to finally not be big and I felt like I failed so the, from the minute I went home I struggled to maintain any weight loss at all um and so even by the finale I might have been the only person I mean I might be the biggest loser of all the biggest losers because by by the finale I'd actually gained seven pounds and that was actually kind of generous of them because I had gone on in a sauna and stuff like that it's probably more like 10 pounds uh, by the final weigh-in and I uh 
I had gone back to college in North Dakota. And I don't know if you know much about college in North Dakota, but there's a lot of drinking involved. I tried to um, not do that. And I, I succeeded for a while, but there was a big gap between the filming and the finale. And I didn't make friends with athletes. I guess I still, I didn't do the work in between here to say like, I'm an athlete. I should be friends with athletes. I should be friends with other people who are doing this. So when you add alcohol back, in my case, you're working out, everything's great. You have one night of drinking and then you feel like crud and then you eat a little crud to feel better. And then next thing you know, you're not working out and it snowballs. And I would say within a year, I had gained a hundred pounds. Oh my goodness. Wow. And then, I mean, we, we don't talk about this enough, but it's the psychology of that. Like you have to be feeling pretty awful about yourself during that time when like you, you think it's your fault, right? Like you, you think what you're doing is your decisions and it's your fault when really it's something that's happening to you. I a hundred percent thought it was my fault. I a hundred percent thought I am a failure. This is so typical. Of course I'm a failure. I'm not lovable. I am not as good as other people. There definitely was some more work that was needed. Interesting. Um, I, maybe this goes without saying, but what well, about like nice. mental health issues? Were you ever diagnosed with any kind of like mental health issues or like depression or anxiety or anything like that? A lot of depression and anxiety. The depression kind of went away later on, but the anxiety is something that persisted all the way up until carnivore. And it was, it was something that was physical. And I would try to explain that to people. I'd be like, listen, I have nothing to be anxious about. I have a higher, I believe in God. I've been doing this work. I have nothing, but I feel anxious. So, so there was that. And then I think we kind of talked about, there's no doubt there was a metabolic a metabolic issue after leaving the show. Yeah, that's very interesting. Before we get to the, the good part of the story and how everything improved, what other chronic conditions were you dealing with? I mean, we mentioned some in the introduction. What other things were um, developing, not just the weight gain, but alongside that? What other things were you experiencing? So I got married and I really struggled to get pregnant. Once I got pregnant, I had no milk. And I was told I did it wrong. I didn't try hard enough, blah, blah, blah. Um, there was no milk. I tried really hard. Um, then I go to have my second baby. There's no milk there either. So I'm having the anxiety, the depression. I'm incredibly tired. Um, I'm struggling with my weight. I'm still trying to, trying to running and restricting, but it's not working anymore. Um, so I would say, uh, Shortly after my daughter was born, which was in 2012, in 2013, I decided I can't have alcohol around my family because I left this part out of the story. But when my dad had to move in with my grandma, she was really struggling with alcoholism. So I was raised, my mother figure was really struggling and she was very abusive. Can you hear me okay with all the noise over here? Oh, there's a little bit of ambient noise, but it's okay. Sorry. Um, so I did not want to have that around my family, so I quit drinking. And that is kind of when things turned around because I joined a 12-step program. And honestly, I suggest a 12-step program for everyone. We would live in utopia if people work through 12 steps because you work through not just quitting a substance that's not doing you any favors, but also... What is my part in things? What can I control? What can't I control? Can I give anything to a higher power? Um, it's just it's just really, really good. That's when I started doing the work between here of I am a human being. I am lovable no matter what I look like, no matter what my job is, no matter what my education is. I have worth and values. Um, and so that is when I... I, I, in that second pregnancy, I had gotten up to 330 pounds. I had um, preeclampsia and I was really, really struggling. I might have to move. That's okay. Is that That's possible? Yeah. Is it possible yeah, we can to move? This. Yep. Sorry about the, uh, you had a little bit of ambient noise there. Adrian found a much quieter place. It was sort of get a little bit of. Uh, rambunctious where she was you, we, we've moved and it, it should be much better from here 
Um, you were talking about like the turnaround. You talked about, you know, what it was like to finally find a 12 step program and learn some of those amazing principles about like the dichotomy of control, the things you can and can't control and how to let go of that thing, how to let go of those things, and, like how to really like love and appreciate yourself, um, you know, regardless of how you are. That must, it sounded like that was very impactful. And that was kind of the the turnaround to what I would say was rock bottom. A hundred percent. And that also made me stop comparing myself to other people so much. And instead of, comparing myself to people to see that we all have value. So a good example would be people would come in, like I've never done a drug in my life really, um, but people would come in as a drug addict. I would see similarity with them instead of being like, oh, well, I'm better because I never did drugs. More, I understand addiction and how that must be so hard for them and then pray for them to overcome it as well see what we have in common. We're both struggling with our relationship. We're both struggling with um, finances, you know, and where's our common ground, not, not where are we different and who's better than who. And that's when I really got to just start loving myself and also other people. And I think that has been the biggest blessing in the whole entire world, because prior to that, it was my value was based on a comparison to other people. You'll always find someone who's better, stronger, faster, whatever than you. And so if you're comparing, your, if you're basing your value on other people, you'll never succeed. You'll never be, you'll never find your value because there's always someone who's better at something than you are. So yeah. that was a huge thing. And that really helped me leave. I didn't know it at the time, but I was in a very hurtful marriage. And so that was another just huge stepping stone as well is, is when you go through those programs, you clean up more than just your relationship with yourself, but you also clean up relationships around you. Um, and, and also at kind of the same time, I was, you know, I had gotten up to 330 pounds while I was pregnant with preeclampsia. I was told that was a total fluke. And I was like, well, that's just so weird. How could this be a fluke? Nobody in my family has ever had this because I was in that mindset of things are hereditary. So it just seemed, it was like super weird to me. But anyway, carrying that weight on my bones, I was like, I need to do something. I cannot continue to go down this road. So I started running and restricting so hard. Um, I was portioning all my meals out. I was eating low fat, low carb. I, I was just very, very, very regimented. I got my first body bug, which is what you used to track in 2013, 14, whatever this was. What about those? Yeah. So I'm doing all the things and I get down to 230 pounds. So I lose a hundred pounds by myself running and restricting again, but then my weight start going back up again. And I'm like, I can't, I can't have this. I'm still blaming myself when it starts going up. I don't see the correlation again of if you lose a hundred pounds, your body starts fighting you. I just thought again, I'm not doing it hard enough. I there's, I'm just not, but I was like, I have to be successful this time. I can't keep living like this. So I asked fellow biggest losers who had lost their weight, like, what are you guys doing? Like, what's the secret? And they told me bariatric surgery. Yeah. So I, being the researchy person I am, I went and looked it all up and, and everybody, of course, everything that you could read said, this is the most successful way to finally lose your weight. So we're back to that. This is going to be the ticket. I'm finally going to be small again. And I have the surgery and I get down to 165 again. And then my weight starts going back up. And this time it comes with hypoglycemia constantly, even though I'm eating low carb, even though I'm not having ice cream, I'm having hypoglycemia. I'll be um, on a run and my blood sugar will just drop out of nowhere. Um, I'll be throwing a birthday party, not eating the cake and ice cream, but just the stress of the birthday party. My blood sugar is dropping, it's dropping all the time to the point I'm afraid to leave home because at any given point you can have hypoglycemia. I start having anemia, chronic fatigue. Um, some of these things were there before the surgery, but they definitely got significantly chronic afterward, like unsolvable afterward. So the past 10 years since that surgery have been a restriction diet of let's let's take one more thing out let's take one more thing out let's take one more thing out in an attempt to not have hypoglycemia an attempt to have some energy again an attempt to be able to have a stable life where you can leave your home and um the, the chronic illness does continue 
I go on to remarry and we go to have our first baby and we get pregnant right away. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yay. Um, and unfortunately the pregnancy ended at 20 weeks mm -hmm. and I go in and I ask them like, what's wrong? And they, they couldn't give me any answers. They said, this just happens sometime. They said it was super rare. I join a group online. I find this is not rare. This is happening like more and more and more all the time, but nobody has any answers. Uh, we go to get pregnant again and it takes a year. And, and we, we were on it every cycle. So it takes how many cycles are there in a year? There's more than 12. Maybe there's 13 cycles in a year. Whatever it was, it's it was a lot of cycles of no, no, no. And we get pregnant again. No milk. Um, but we did get a healthy baby, so I'm grateful for that. Uh, we go to get pregnant again, and this time I'm like, I'm going to have milk. And there's a reason I'm telling you this no milk thing, because when I went into the doctor, that should have been a red flag to someone. Instead of being like, she's just not trying hard enough. I mean, they don't have to try in the tribes. If you're a yeah. tribal person, you don't have to try. And and then they'll say like, oh, you didn't you didn't go to enough lactation consultants. Like this is a natural process. I should never have to go to a lactation consultant. It should just kind of happen. And we go to have baby number four. I birth them at home in a bathtub. We stay skin to skin for six weeks because this time the natural process is I'm not going to miss a single one. It's going to be so natural and beautiful. I have all the supplements. I'm taking the herbs. I'm eating the healthy foods. I've cut the chemicals. I've cut the dairy because I was afraid that inflamed me somehow and still no milk. And I catch the bad virus. So not only do I not have milk, but now I'm debilitated. I am having chronic fatigue. I have brain fog so bad that I can't hardly drive. I can't remember to pick up my kids from school. I, I can't, I don't have any energy to go up and down the stairs. People are brushing this off saying, this is just postpartum. This is just having a baby. And I'm like, no, this is like my fifth baby. This is not normal. <laughs> this wow. is not postpartum. I'm having terror where I'm just like holding my babies because every single night, for some reason, terror would come over me that they were just going to fall over and die. I'm asking family members, please come over. I can't explain it, but I don't feel okay. I can't, I need help. I can't take care of my kids. I don't feel okay. And everybody was like, you look okay. And I'm like, no, I don't. I would like take selfies. Cause I knew that I looked terrible, but everybody was just used to me looking terrible because as the years went on, I was just getting more and more and more sick. My metabolism was more dead. My energy was gone. My hormones were not good. Um, so anyway, I don't have milk or baby, this final baby either. So I finally go to a functional medicine doctor and she runs a spit test and a urine test and a blood test. And she goes, your adrenals are level three dysfunction, whatever that is bad. And you're, you have, you have Hashimoto's and your inflammation markers are through the roof. And she said, Adrian, you have to change. You can't, you can't keep going on. Like you have been, you need some help you need some rest. Your body is not functioning on the inside. She didn't really have a lot of solutions because she didn't want to give me medicine for one correlates with the other. So that's where I was. I was just kind of left with, Hey, you've got a bunch of autoimmune. You've got long haulers. You've got lichen sclerosis, which is an itchy skin condition, autoimmune, you've got autoimmune. I was just kind of left with no solutions, but a whole bunch of stuff. And so that's when my dad said, hey, I'm no grains, no sugar, Vinny. He was doing that. He lost 60 pounds on that. He, he goes, Vinny's co-host, she, she went carnivore to fix her autoimmune. You should give that a try. And I was like, the green beans? You want me to drop the green beans? Because at this point, I had dropped everything. I had, I mean, I was down to just vegetables and chicken. I started a quail farm because I knew eggs could be inflammatory. So I wanted the quail eggs and the quail meat that I would raise myself. And I had chickens and I had um, meat chickens and I had meat rabbits. So I'm trying to raise my own food. I had no idea though, that I was raising super lean animals. <laughs> um, <laughs> Seriously. Anyway, he said, give it a try. And so January, 2023, 
that's when I said, okay, I got to do something because I can't take care of my kids and I'm just getting more sick by the day. And I would say within a, a few weeks, I was getting better sleep. My hypoglycemia has been gone ever since. No more hypoglycemia. Um, and my skin is cleared up. It's not itchy anymore. Um, I used to have food reactions constantly. No more food reactions. Very few food reactions. Um, I just feel like a new human being. And there's more to this story because it turns out that the underlying issue for me, I believe, is called SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So I'm working on that piece too, but the, the carnivore diet has been just a game changer in the whole thing. Wow. So January 1st, 2023, was this a transition onto Vinny's no sugar, no grain, um, mostly meat and some other things, or was that like the transition onto carnivore proper, which is, you know, very low, anything other than meat? He had mentioned this to me like six times. Cause I don't know how many times it takes you to hear something before it clicks. So when he said something the year before, I had started watching carnivore content in like November. And my main person actually was Paul Saladino. Yeah. But before I would ever go carnivore, because I already had sugar issues, I had to look up like, can I be a fruit and meat person? And I ruled that out um, because of the hypoglycemia. But also I knew I had a food addiction. So when I went carnivore, I went, I went carnivore. I went like... Laura Spath carnivore. Wow. Wow. She's lovely. We love her. Um, interestingly, you mentioned Paul Saladino. Um, he's somebody that I definitely respect in the space. I've got his book behind me, uh, the carnivore code, um, you know, in 2021, when he kind of transitioned from being, you know, mostly a fairly strict carnivore with tons of organs. He then transitioned over to like lots of fruit and fruit juice and all that stuff. I've always made the argument that as as much as I respect him, respect his work, it's the it's people like yourself that are out there, or like me that like I know about myself. I can't have a lot of fruit. It's going to have a lot of sugar, and it's going to like reignite some sugar issues. I find it really impressive that you were able to listen to him and then do some further research and decide like this way of doing it is not going to work for me. I really get nervous about the people that don't take that step and really look into it and just say like, oh wow, he's super healthy. I'm going to eat carnivore in this way, and carnivore means you know, whatever it is, like 300 grams of, of fruit and fructose in a day. I don't know. I really worry about that. So it's cool that you were able to like learn that about yourself. I feel like a lot of people, this is like a, a long journey and a lot of people start out low carb. And so their spidey sense is already up of like, I feel better low carb. And so I think a lot of people question that piece. Everybody yeah. that I've known anyway, but I That's find good. it helpful to tell people about Paul Saladino because when he talks about different ingredients and different things and why we don't eat them, it really empowers you to, with knowledge of, I don't just eat that because I'm low carb and I'm carnivore. I don't eat that because that does this to my body. Mm -hmm. And so I, I find him still to be a good resource for people. And then I just leave it up to them. Some people have a really hard time swallowing no more plants. And so to, at least if they could have some plants that are, less inflammatory, less anti-nutrients that's preferred to me then. So people really struggle with the no plant thing. Check out Paul. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think he does a great job communicating that message. I just worry about some of the people with the, the sugar addiction and that kind of reigniting. Um, so, okay. So it's been about a year and a half that you've been carnivore. Um, you know, what other benefits do you notice? I, I, you know, meeting you in person, I would have never assumed that you would have been a biggest loser contestant. You look perfectly fit and healthy to me. Um, what other things have you noticed though, besides, you know, weight loss, stabilization in your weight? Um, do you feel like you're at your goal now? And then what other like kind of benefits did you see from changing the way you're eating and, and eating a carnivore diet? So a huge thing with every single weight loss attempt I've ever had is the rebound. Like you, at the end of it, you just feel starving. You just feel ravenous. And another problem was I always was doing a ton, a ton of hardcore running with it. So I was running and restricting and it just leaves you so tired. So in the carnivore diet, I know some people still struggle with the full feeling, but as long as I'm not eating sweets and as long as I'm not eating dairy, my full sensors work pretty well. And maybe that's from my surgery. I don't know, but to get to be full and to get to be nourished at the end of every push that I do, it's easy to just keep doing it because 
I get to be more full. And so to go back to like, let's say I heard you talking with Linda about challenges. I think challenges are great because it helps push you towards your goal. And it's great for people who are really structured. I like structure. Uh, But then at the end of that, you get to go back to, I eat a lot of beef. I eat a lot of fish and I just keep moving in the sun and it's very doable and it's very nourishing. Um, I love that. I feel like my skin is the best it's ever been in my life. I feel like my vision has improved. It has improved significantly. Um, There's still some things I'm working on because I have the chronic inflammatory response syndrome. I had to clean up the air that I was breathing as well. And I just have some inflammation still to heal, but I look to people like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Linda's living well, she works for Dr. Rimka. You know, she's been doing this for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. And sometimes the healing just takes time. And I just picture as I'm eating these lower inflammatory nourishing foods that slowly my gut biome is getting better every day. Even if it's really slow, not consuming that sugar and the carbs and the chemicals is helping my gut flora just heal. And the more my gut can heal, the more my inflammation can go down and my brain can get better and my skin can get better. And so that's what I picture. Another thing that I do is I walk in the sun a lot and I used to not get any sun at all because I was like everybody else, I was afraid of the sun. I feel like the sun has just been so nourishing in itself too. You just, it's, it's brought up my vitamin D. I've struggled with vitamin D my whole, as long as I can remember for years and years. And so it's been great to get that. I feel like it's just so nourishing and my mood is so much better. I used to be on the verge of anxiousness all the time, like a physical anxiousness, very, very physical. It's like under your skin and it's in your heart. I can't even remember the last time that happens. I can't, I it's, I can't so imagine you like that. Calm. You can't imagine me like that. Oh, it's like my, no, I only know that I only know that you that's been carnivore for over a year. So I can't imagine that the, the bubbly, happy, optimistic, super energetic version of yourself. That's the only thing I can picture. Oh yeah. And, um, then to the weight. So I'm still struggling with my hormones and I'm working on healing those. So the weight isn't perfect, but it, and I'm not to like my goal but this, darn it, this is some of the best I've ever looked in my whole life. And I'll take it. If I never lose another pound again, I am completely happy. Love it. And and it hasn't just blown up like, like it did with the biggest loser, like it did with the surgery, like it did with every diet I've ever done. It didn't just, you just, you don't wake up the next day huge. But for me, that does require me to moderate or restrict or eliminate dairy. Yeah. Like yeah, the secondary comes back. Yep. Yeah. That's a tough thing to accept when you live in the part of the country that you do, where you have like access to the very best dairy in the country. That That is tough. But yeah, that can be problematic for some people. And I love it. I say all the time, like this is the one diet you might come to it for the weight loss, but eventually if you stick with it long enough, you'll almost like forget about the weight loss and the fat loss. That's all just happening in the background, but to, to feel good and have your brain be very clear and to have energy and all those things, it's so much better than you know having your gravity on planet earth be a certain number that you think it should be you know what i mean like to to feel good and experience life in that different way is so much more valuable um i really love the work that you are i don't know if it's work but you're staying involved with the community as far as the biggest loser contestants community you're interviewing them tell us about them like what what is what are they like what's the general kind of feeling of people that have gone through this contest or are people, you know, kind of like we hear about with these studies where they gained all the weight back and they're really miserable and like the health is really poor and now they really can't lose weight because of all the metabolic effects that you and I've already talked about. Like, what is the community like? It is such a mixed bag because some people were put on the show because they make good TV. <laughs> some people were put on the good show point. because they're just, um, really positive, good people that everybody loves. You you know, those people that you just, everybody loves them. And that's a lot of the people is very, very lovable. Um, 
if you've gained a ton of weight, you're probably not super active in the alumni group. I know that was me, you know, for a long time. That was me not active at all. Didn't even look in there. It gave me a little, it gave me anxiety to look in that group. You know, um, I see a lot of people, you know, everybody's still just trying to, one thing I can say that's positive about just about everybody in the group is that they still want to help and inspire other people. Mm. They really have that desire inside of them to, to, to be a light to other people. Um, I do see a lot of people are, you know, it's so hard to access. It's, I think people don't even know about carnivore. So they're still doing things like surgeries and shots. And I mean, I totally get it. I did surgery. I totally get it. But I wish that they knew how good they could feel if they did this. If I would have known about carnivore, I would have never in a million bajillion quadrillion years had that surgery. And when I look back at the surgery, I think it's barbaric. <laughs> I I just... I just find it to be so odd. I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of uh, the Hunger Games, how they do very strange things so they can eat all the food and be super gluttonous. And so to me, to, to chop up your body instead of learning a different way, which I didn't know. I'm a hardworking person. Many of these people are hardworking. That's one thing I really want to say is if restricting and running worked, then it would have worked for most of these people, because they are so hardworking and they did it, they achieved it. So if that was something that truly worked long-term, it would have worked for us, especially being in the light and wanting it so badly. So since mostly it didn't work for anybody, because I don't know anybody who's still working out seven hours a day and eating 900 calories. I don't know anybody that's doing it. Um, since it didn't work for us, I'm going to say, I wish that people knew, please stop trying that because it's, it's long-term, not, it's not the ticket eating yep. more protein, eating nourishing food. I think that's the ticket and, and movement and strength. I love, I was just listening to an interview with Nat coach, Nat and Courtney. And she said that she felt the ticket to an optimal body isn't running and cardio and restricting your calories and all these challenges. She said it was eating protein and building muscle because ultimately that's going to build you your best metabolism. Yeah, I agree. I could not agree more. And I've also, awesome, I also pointed out to people once I understood kind of how this was working, what was going on, like the people that you see that are the biggest out there, they may have had the most willpower out of anybody. You can only really get that way. If you do multiple rounds of restriction combined with burning lots of calories, they may be in the ones that stuck with the running program way longer. It's just, they didn't understand that those running programs and the depletion of calories is what causes so much weight gain on the back end. These are the people that are working probably way harder that a lot of people out there and a lot of people may just be getting off kind of easy because they're not doing those things and they may be regulating their metabolism way better because of it. So it's a really good point. I look at my husband. He's never dieted in his life. All he had to do was refu um, remove a few French fries and he lost 30 pounds. But yeah. why? Probably because he never dieted his whole life. Yep. Um, I think it's Todd Carnivore Cure. He one time fasted for 21 days. My husband's never fasted in his life, you know? And here Todd is struggling at 700 pounds. Was he at six or 700 pounds? You know, carnivore here, Todd. Yep. He's amazing. He worked so hard. And yet people look at him and go, oh, he must be huffing down the pizzas. No, yeah, obviously there's something metabolically happening here. Yep. That's such a good point. I love that. Uh, so what are, what are your plans for the future? Where do you think you're going to continue taking this and share your message? Like, what are you going to do with some of this information? I really want to keep sharing like you're doing, because if there's anybody else out there who is 300, 400, however big you are, and you just think this is how I've been my whole life, it can't be anything else. It can't because I was 330 pounds. And I have tried all the things and I thought for sure, this is just the way it is. And it doesn't have to be that way. So I want to keep 
sharing in hopes that we can keep inspiring and spreading the message. Like even if nobody nationally ever sees my channel, but a couple neighbors do, and they tell a couple neighbors and it has a local impact, I would be so happy. So that is my goal is to just share that we need to eat more meat. Another thing that's really in my heart is hoping that we can get our kids some more meat. I am not saying everybody has to be carnivore, but let's get our kids nourished. Let's get them some more meat. Um, so that is my goal is to just keep sharing and be a stay-at-home mom and, and get to make more friends. And um, I love going to meetups and I love, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I love it. Well, like I said, it was so awesome to actually meet you and hang out with you in person. And again, just knowing you and the bubbly self that you are and so positive and have such great energy. It, it's again, it's hard to imagine what that would have been like not being you, but I, I think what you're doing is really inspiring. What you've gone through is really inspiring. And then turn around and want to share that message with anybody who's ready to hear it, I think is wonderful. So I'm really hoping that someday we can follow up on this conversation and hear that, yeah, maybe there are a few people in you know your local community, people that you've touched all over the country with your YouTube channel, and then also in the, in the Biggest Loser community, that maybe some people are seeing you as a beacon, as an example, and are starting to come to you for advice and change in their own lives. Because I think you're in a really unique an amazing situation to be able to do that. So I'm glad that's been your mission. I'm so glad you took time to be on our show today. Where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work? I'm Adrian K. Bloodhill on YouTube and Instagram. That is very, very easy to remember. We will definitely tag that in the show notes. Uh, I, I love your channel. You do wonderful content, uh, like I said. And so we're just so grateful for you and your incredible story and your willingness to continue to share it, not only on your channel, but on our show today. So Adrian, thank you so very much for everything you do and for taking the time to be on our show. We really appreciate you. Thanks for having me. It was such an honor. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio. <laughs>